Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to rise in your place, please rise. So I want to welcome everyone and acknowledge that we are meeting here on the territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And please join me in singing the national anthem. <clears throat> oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Eta valor, de foi trope, protégera no foies, no Ladies and gentlemen, that was Tiffany Gooch. And if I may say, that was TiffanyGooch.com and her songs are going to be available on iTunes very soon. Congratulations. Tiffany, thank you for that. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, If I may. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome to the Pearson Center. My name is Sandra Pupatello, and I'm delighted to welcome you here. That's very nice. <laughs> I'm delighted to welcome you here. This is actually our second fundraising event here in Toronto for the Pearson Center. I'm joined at the podium by Andrew Cardozo, the president of Pearson Center. Andrew, welcome. And before I go any further, we all know that we've been called and cajoled to be with us, to support, to support the center to this wonderful event. And this couldn't help happen without my co-chair, and I'm delighted to introduce Monty Quinter, co-chair for this evening's event. Monty's going to stand in the front. <laughs> and it's important to note that Monty is here tonight because last week he was busy having back surgery. So Monty, you are a trooper for being here this evening. It's wonderful. I think his, his career is spanning four decades of public service. Thank you so much, Monty. So many of you may know, or you will learn this evening about the Pearson Center. It is a progressive think tank. And the beauty of this is, is that it is a centrist think tank. The reason that that's important is that many of us may know of those on the left and those on the right. And we believe that we have to have public policy that is developed in a pragmatic and useful way for government, and we believe that a centrist public policy think tank is exactly what the doctors ordered. I'm delighted to tell you that in its only second year of operation under the leadership of Andrew Cardozo, it's developed more than 23 papers, 17 positions of which ended up in public policy platforms during the most recent election. I think that is an astounding achievement for the Pearson Center. I want to introduce a number of VIPs who are here this evening and who've made it very difficult for us to start on time. It's so exciting 
it's very exciting to see these public figures who's been, who have been with us in public service for so many years and to have so many of them here in the room, we have to talk to you. So I think it's just a tribute to you and who you are and who you've been for us uh, that you've joined us this evening. And if you don't mind, I'd like to acknowledge them. I'm going to do this in sort of a series or batch of three. So if you could hold your applause, with every batch, we're going to give them a really good round, if that's OK. Are those who have been in office, the Right Honorable John Turner. <laughs> He's the only exception, OK? <laughs> the Honorable, and could you please stand when I call your name, the Honorable Jean Augustine, the Honorable John Baird, Chris Bentley, Barry Campbell, Olivia Chow, Dwight Duncan, Charles Harnick, Dalton McGinty, the Honorable Maria Minna, the Honorable Bob Ray, the Honorable Jerry Weiner, and Paul Zed. Thank you for being here. From the legislature, from the legislature of Ontario, the Honorable Stephen Del Duca, the Honorable Madeleine Mayer, if I could get you to stand, please, the Honorable Reza Moridi, Indira Naidu Harris, Honorable Yasser Nakvi. Thank you so much for being here. From the Federal House, our federal members of Parliament, Gary Ananda Sangari. Bill Blair, the Honorable Jim Carr, Anthony Housefather, Michael Levitt, James Maloney, the Honorable John McKay, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Marco Mendocino, Rob Oliphant, Kyle Peterson, Yasmin Ratanzi, Ruby Sahota, Ramesh Sanga, Francesco Sobera, Arif Varani, the Honorable Carolyn Bennett. We do have other notables here this evening, and I must mention the Honorable Margaret McCain, Senator Art Eggleton, His Excellency, His Excellency Raphael Barak, the Ambassador of Israel, the Indeed. The Honorable Roy McMurtry, Vaughn Counselor, our Vaughn Counselor Alan Sheffman, Sharon Salzberg Gray, Adrian McDonald, Mohammed Al Saadi. Thank you so much for being here. Now the fun part. I have to tell you that this would not be possible without tremendous sponsors. And many of, of you are sitting here because of those very sponsors. And I want to tell you that you've made this the kind of vibrant event that we could feel in that first session of networking tonight. So if you don't mind me sharing with everyone, once you get a chance to breeze through your program and you call all of the sponsors to thank them for participating tonight, which would be wonderful, well, let me say at the superior level, Canada's Building Trade Unions, Fiera Foods Company, the Provincial Building and Construction Trades, Council of Ontario. A special shout out to Patrick Dillon. <laughs> there you are. Uniform, we're delighted to have you all as our superior level sponsors. At the district level, we have Aurora Strategy, Bespoke Events, helping us with all of the organization this evening. Carpenters District Council of Ontario, Clearly Content, Larry and Judy Tannenbaum, the Law Society of Upper Canada. I'm delighted that Bob Lapper is here this evening joining us. The Honorable Margaret Norrie McCain. Thank you so much to our district level sponsors. And at the county level, we have a tremendous number of wonderful sponsors. Benjamin and Levitt Families, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, the CG Group, Charles S. Coffey. Where is Charles? There he is. 
sitting at the back, but certainly a notable. Ranjit Singh July, Evolution Wines. Keeley and Associates, thank you, Mark. Main Street Research, Adrian McDonald, Dalton McGinty. The law firm of Macmillan, LLP, Dwight, thank you so much. Merchant Law Group, James C. Morton, Sandra Pupatello, RBC, Joel and Jill Reitman, and Ryerson University. Thank you to our county sponsors. And with that, I'm delighted to turn it over to a gentleman who only in two years is making the Pearson Center the kind of think tank that people want to think. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. Um, I just want to say there are about 20 seats up here on, the, on this side of the room, so if there are people too far back, feel free to come forward. Uh, there's about 20, 25 seats over this side. So as you can see from your program, we've got a few people that we're going to hear from uh, first, um, and I think you'll want to hear from them. We have uh, three ministers of the new government who are here, and we're going to ask them to say a few words. We're going to keep them to two to three minutes. Um, we'll do our best to do that. And you know that politicians always keep to their time limits. Um, to start with, I'd like to introduce uh, two of the new members of, of Parliament. The Honorable Jim Carr, Member of Parliament for Winnipeg South Centre and Minister for Natural Resources. I want to tell you by way of introduction that he's also been an oboist with the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra, Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party of Manitoba, and the founding CEO of the Business Council of Manitoba. In welcoming him, I want to take a, a second and just say, just thank him publicly uh, for his support and advice to the Pearson Center, dating back to our first conversation some three years ago uh, when we were introduced by a board member of the center and our mutual friend, Lloyd Axworthy. Um, I appreciate the, the advice and the support you've given us since, since, uh, you, since we started. That was the late Anthony Housefather just coming in. <laughs> Um, I mean, late in arrival, um, and, and it's, my, it's my pleasure to introduce the very cultured Minister of Natural Resources. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, it wasn't only that we were introduced at Lloyd Axworthy's house. It was, it was a steamy August night, and there were cigars and scotch. As there are every year that we meet at Lloyd Axworthy's house, and I don't think any one of them was as productive as it was that night, as we see now. To uh, be able to talk about Lester Pearson and Erwin Kotler at the same time is a pleasure, and there's actually some synergy between those two very fine people who have promoted in their own way the essential values of being Canadian. Remarkable that Lester Pearson, in only five years of minority government, did so much for Canada and for the world. I'm not talking about the Nobel Peace Prize in 1957 for having sorted out the Suez Crisis. I am, though, talking about Medicare, and I am talking about the Canada Pension Plan, and I am talking about the Canadian flag, and I also could be talking about a new role for Canada in the world through multilateral institutions, the way he had built up Canada's reputation abroad for all of the right reasons. And here is Erwin Kotler, who has done the same thing, a legacy of integrity, of intelligence, of respect for the essential values of being Canadian that he takes and exports internationally that do us all proud. And as a member of Winnipeg's Jewish community, I can tell you that growing up meant a lot when you knew that Erwin Kotler was the gold star, the gold star of integrity, of honesty, and of true values. And there was never a contradiction or a competition about being Jewish and about being Canadian. It was the freedom. It was the freedom to be who we are and our identity that makes Canada so strong. So, on behalf of Prime Minister Trudeau, Boy, that sounds good. <laughs> and my uh, colleagues in cabinet and caucus, many of whom are here tonight, 
Just to let you know that I thought until about a half an hour ago that Winnipeg was the center of the world, but you have all convinced me that at least for a moment it might be Toronto. <laughs> On behalf of our government, our prime minister, our community, congratulations to you, Erwin. We're so keen to know about the next accomplishments and congratulations to the Pearson Center for doing such great work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Carr. Um, next, I'd like you to in introduce you to my member of parliament. I live in Ottawa. Uh, Catherine McKenna is the, is, the, is the member of parliament, the new member of parliament for Ottawa Centre. Um, a lawyer by training, she was, the, she was actually a law student at Professor Kotler at McGill University, and he tells us one of, one of his best. She has worked in Ottawa and in Indonesia and has been executive director of, the Canadian, of Canadian Lawyers Abroad and the Banff Centre. Um, I, I, and, and since the swearing in of the new government is the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the first minister to have that title because of the seriousness given to both aspects of, of her portfolio. I want to welcome you back to the Pearson Centre, Minister. Uh, you've had the chance to come to a number of our, our, our events over the last two or three years. We've had the benefit of your participation, and I look forward to many more years of that. Catherine McKenna. Well, I'm thrilled to be here. I mean, it's amazing as I look around the room, there are so many faces uh, that I know through all sorts of parts of my lives. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's just a thrill, uh, as you can imagine, a uh, new politician. Uh, it's amazing to be in a cabinet with someone like Jim Carr, where we actually have a Minister of Natural Resources and a Minister of Environment and Climate Change that actually work together, probably the first time ever. Uh, <laughs> And to look around at, at so many of my colleagues, but so many of you who have supported me, uh, I just want to thank you. Um, I do want to recognize that we're on the territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, and it is a credit to, uh, to Andrew Cardozo and the Pearson uh, Center that the first project is going to be about reconciliation. Uh, parce que c'est le plus grand projet qu'on a pour notre pays. Le changement climatique, c'est vraiment important, mais si on ne peut pas résoudre le problème, comment on va... On va uh, travail en partenariat avec nos, uh, nos uh, Premières Nations, nos, uh, nos amis uh, Métis uh, et Inuits, on ne va pas être le pays qu'on pourrait être. Uh, and I really believe that, and actually I, I say that as I look at, uh, at Carolyn Bennett, a great friend and an amazing advocate uh, for Indigenous peoples. Um, so it actually warms my heart to be here because uh, policy matters. <laughs> Uh, and, it, and it's easy to be, you know, to, to kind of sit back. Uh, there are many liberals. I know John Baird, hi, you're not a liberal, and uh, Olivia Chow, <laughs> neither are you. But there are many liberals in this, uh, in this room. Uh, and, um, you know, it's easy to say, oh, of course, we're all progressives. Uh, but it, it wasn't always that easy. And you might remember the election and some of the issues we were discussing. Um, and Andrew had an idea, and I've been there, where you have an idea, and not everyone believes of you, in you, and it's going to be really hard, and you're going to slog through. And that's what Andrew did. He had the idea for the Pearson Center. He realized that it was really important that we promote progressive ideas, that policy matters. And I was always thrilled to be at these events uh, because we would talk about real issues that matter to real people in a way that resonated. Uh, and I think it is really important, and you can't take it for granted. And running, having started a charity, uh, it's really hard. And I thank you, Andrew, for spending for the two years. And look at this. I mean, look at how many people are here right now. It's incredible. <laughs> and now there's Irwin. I mean, it's, it's a little hard to know what to say about Irwin. I still remember when I walked into his class. You know, as a law student, uh, I think I was in my... I took a couple of classes uh, with her, and they were very unusual classes. You never knew what you were getting in his classes. Uh, he'd kind of walk in, and he'd be like, oh, my God, the issue of the day is. Uh, and it was always, you know, you never knew what the, the big human rights issue of the day was going to be. But Irwin was at the forefront of all of those issues. Uh, and, and it's amazing because he really inspired me. Because politics, people get very jaded about politicians. Oh, politicians just do whatever the constituents want or whatever they think is easy. Uh, Irwin never did that. He always stood up for what he believed in. And he inspired so many of us. And where's Sharon Gray? I know Sharon Gray is somewhere in the room. 
she was just saying to me, there's Sharon, uh, another member of, uh, another resident of Ottawa Centre. Uh, Ottawa Centre is actually the centre of the University of Toronto, people are wrong. Uh, but, uh, but Sharon was saying that, that or it was Erwin who inspired her to run. Uh, and that's really amazing because you didn't care if you're a woman, you didn't care if, you know, what, you know, what your background was. You just cared that good people would stand up and run and you inspired us. And I know Anthony House, House Father is here. Other may, I'm sure there's probably other students of yours. So I, I want to thank you for that. And I'm really happy that you're doing your Pursuing Justice project because I think it is really important as I look at human rights uh, activists in this room. Uh, very, very important. Et la dernière chose que je vais dire, uh, je suis heureuse uh, qu'il y a des... On, on est, on est uh, de tous les partis. Je pense que c'est vraiment important. Moi, j'ai un dossier qui est vraiment difficile, les changements climatiques. Uh, climate change is a hard file. I, you know, I love it. I'm so honored that the Prime Minister asked me to do this. Um, but it's tough. But it's not a partisan file. And, and policy shouldn't be partisan. And as I was you know, joking around with John Barrett, he helped me out because he, he got me my scheduler. Anyone who's been in politics realizes that the schedule actually is probably the most important person uh, in your life because uh, they put some, some controls on your life. Uh, as well as Olivia Chow when we were laughing about how she was on the parliamentary swim team. I just realized that we have an amazing country and we can do amazing things, but we have to do it together. And so I'm so thrilled that we have people from every party because that's how we're going to get changed. So now, so now Andrew's like, okay, that's great, Catherine, but just get off the stage. So I'm going to get off. But uh, anyway, I'm thrilled to be here with so many of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I just want to take a second, since people have mentioned my role in, in the Pearson Center, I just want to uh, guide you to the inside back cover of your program that lists a number of people from the board and the organizing committee of today's event who've really made this all possible. Thank you to all of you. And I think one of the reasons people came here in big numbers is because that name on our advertisement, which was Irvin Kotler. So let's not forget that part. I, I want to introduce a, another good friend of Irvin Kotler, a good friend of the Pearson Center, Car uh, Minister Carolyn Bennett. Uh, she, many of you in the room will know her as the Member of Parliament uh, for St. Paul's. Uh, two things I want to tell you and why she's so really well positioned for this, for this portfolio. For all the time that she's been in Parliament, she's been a leading member who's talked about the rights and the, and the importance of the advancement of, of Aboriginal peoples across this country. She perhaps knows people from across the country and the, the far north, the north and far north, better than any other member of Parliament across all Indigenous communities. So she's an excellent um, a person for that reason. The other is Carolyn has been dedicated to uh, the advancement of women in politics and has done a great deal to ensure that more women run in the Liberal Party and, and other parties. Uh, so Carolyn Bennett, please come to the stage. Thank you, Andrew, and uh, yeah, thank you uh, to the Pearson Center for send throwing such an amazing party. And uh, as my colleagues have said, with such an ama amazing magnet uh, of uh, our friend Irwin, uh, it is, uh, it is amazing. I think that because Erwin was such an icon to all of us that when he was running for parliament, we thought this was an amazing, amazing um, nonpartisan catch uh, in values and principles. And But it was my first town hall meeting with Erwin Kotler when, when my right honorable constituent showed up, uh, John Turner, that I recognized that Irwin had worked in John's office and that, that this was a, an ongoing, progressive, liberal, human rights uh, journey um, that rightfully ended up in the Parliament of Canada and as the Justice Minister and Attorney General. This, uh, this it still makes us cry in that uh, you have taught us so much. And for those of us that... Uh, for those of you that don't know that before Erwin was the minister, um, he was, I, I, I'm going to get into trouble for this, but probably the most important member of Women's Caucus. Uh, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Women's Caucus members 
um, used to think that we could do this all on our own. And, uh, and then after a while, when we realized we hadn't been listened to for weeks and weeks and months, that we would send Irwin out to say the same thing that we've been saying for a very long time. And he would do something like women's rights or human rights, and then everybody would listen, and <laughs> we'd get what we've been asking for. And so, um, I don't know, it just seemed to work coming from him. And uh, we never let him miss a meeting, because uh, we, we always wanted to make sure that if we needed his help and needed him to be deployed, um, that uh, that he actually understood the full conversation and could come up with his full seven to ten points on on that most of which he'd added himself because we you know we'd only mentioned two uh, so uh, it is it is um, it is a total honor um, to be here tonight and I think some of you know I was supposed to be in Nunavut and uh, and. Uh, was really upset that I was going to miss this. So this is just a, an amazing bonus to be here. Uh, it, it is about being a great politician is being a great teacher. And, and I think that uh, Irwin has taught us all so much. And whether it's me having to call him before I had to go to Geneva and try and explain whether health was a human right or not, or, or all of the things that uh, but that uh, Irwin has been able to teach us. And, and now, um, in my job um, here on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit, um, that uh, Irwin's writings and his understanding of what are basic human rights um, and the rights and recognition of the people who were here first, um, I think, uh, is something that all of us settlers have to understand a bit better. And uh, we will be counting on you forever for our coaching and our ability to just get this, this really unfinished business of Confederation done. So thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, it was mentioned that Irwin did in fact work as a policy advisor to minister at the time, then Justice Minister John Turner. And as you know, John Turner is here this evening as the Right Honorable, but spent many years in, in multiple roles, Minister of Finance, Minister of Justice, and of course, we all know him as our great Prime Minister. Welcome to the Right Honorable John Turner. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. I'm very, very proud to be here. Aaron Cutler was my special assistant when I was Minister of Justice, 19, 1968 to 1972. He uh, had a tremendous talent, which I recognized. He had a great Jewish conscience, which I appreciated. He had an ambition to do well for the people who needed our help. He was a great stimulus in our department. And I uh, want to say that as he moved on in his political career, including Minister of Justice, he uh, recognized that people skills needed to be as St. Augustine of my church would say, return to people what they deserve. Those to whom God has given talent, let them give talent to those who need it. And Erwin, <laughs> and Erwin has been that reminder of people skills and the sponsorship of talent. He uh, has been a tremendous sponsor of skills for people who needed it in Canada and across the world. He's a remarkable human being. And St. Augustine would be proud of this Jewish boy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. 
That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Right Honorable John Turner. As you might know, there were four Prime Ministers that have been honorary co-chairs of this evening's event, the Right Honorable John Turner being one. And we have another. I'd like you to turn your attention to the screen. The Pearson Center's initiative in creating the Pursuit of Justice project marks an important step in Canada's fight for its values in terms of justice, inclusion, and diversity. All of these are so important as we face up to the demands that the world is placing on us, demands that challenge our values, demands that we must fight for, and in fact, demands that we must lead. That the program will take the debate in the direction that it must is evidenced by the fact that the Pearson Center has asked Erwin Kotler to open the debate. Pearson Center is so important because what we need if the debate in this country is going to deal with the fundamental issues faced by Canadians and faced by their governments is to have a view, a perspective from the Centre. And that's what the Pearson Centre does. It understands the importance of social policy and it understands the importance of a strong economy and also understands that you're not going to have both unless both work together. You know, it's not surprising that I congratulate the Pearson Centre for in, term, in, co in the context of the justice debate focusing on the Indigenous issue. The fact is that the underfunding of Indigenous education, of Indigenous health care, of child welfare, has simply been a discrimination that is abhorrent to anybody who believes in a strong and a fair society. But let me tell you something. Ignoring Indigenous Canada is also lousy economics. I've known Erwin Kotler for a long time in terms of human rights, in terms of the kinds of things he stood for in South Africa with Nelson Mandela, in terms of the kinds of things he stood for as Minister of Justice, in terms of gay rights, uh, in terms of all of the, the, the important role of Parliament in protecting our rights. Erwin Kotler has been a giant among people. And to the Centre, well done. And of course, many of you may know that it was uh, Prime Minister Paul Martin that appointed Erwin Kotler to Minister of Justice and the Attorney General. So we were delighted, of course. Um, and as uh, the Right Honourable John Turner said, when you have the skill, you must deploy it. So we thought that was, uh, that was notable. I want to uh, next introduce you to the Attorney General of Ontario. I am delighted to introduce a, a woman that I was a, a former colleague with, uh, Madeleine Mayer. She is notable from Ottawa, but I know her as a dynamo MPP, and I am delighted to introduce the Attorney General of Ontario, Madeleine Mayer. Thank you very much, Sandra. Good evening, everyone. Bonsoir, tout le monde. It uh, gives me a great pleasure to bring a greeting from uh, my government, the government of Ontario, and my premier, Kathleen Wynne. I am joined tonight by familiar faces of past and present colleagues, our federal partners, and other renowned dignitaries. Je souhaiterais tout d'abord féliciter uh, le Centre Pearson pour l'organisation de ce beau gala, ainsi que toutes les personnes qui ont contribué au succès de cette soirée. The Pearson Center plays an important role as a progressive research organization on many economic and social issues. It brings together people of differing views to find common solutions and that are very useful to us, government. As Attorney General of Ontario, I am pleased to be here tonight to help launch the Pearson Center's newest initiative, the P Pursuing Justice Project. This project is focused on increasing the understanding about justice, diversity, and inclusion for all Canadians. One of the first projects the initiative will look at will be the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, which is a priority and should be a priority for all governments. <laughs> Reconciliation is a journey and a road that we must walk together, and Ontario has made it a priority 
to act on the Commission's calls to action. I am pleased to honor tonight Erwin Cutler for his work as Canada's Attorney General and Minister of Justice. As Minister of Justice and Attorney General, Erwin Cutler initiated the first ever comprehensive reform of the Supreme Court appointment process and helped make it the most gender representative Supreme Court in the world. Thank you. He appointed the first ever Aboriginal and visible minority justices to the Ontario Court of Appeal and initiated the first ever law on human trafficking. Erwin Cutler also crafted the Civil Marriage Act, the first ever legislation to grant marriage equality to same-sex couples. Son travail et tous les accomplissements sont bénéfiques pour la population au Canada, mais aussi au niveau international. We look forward to the issues you will raise in your next role, as there is much work to be done. Thank you again for inviting me to say a few words tonight. I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Merci. Miigwech. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite our moderator and our honored guests to make their way to the stage. And while I do that, I'm going to introduce our moderator. I want to first mention that we have another honored guest here this evening, First Nation Chief Roland Montague Beausoleil. Is he here? Where did he go? There we are. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Can we bring our honored guest and our moderator to the stage. I am delighted to introduce the moderator this evening. Her name is Indira Nadu Harris. She was recently elected, but should be a familiar face to many of us through her work as a journalist with Omni, with CBC. And we're delighted that she has a special relationship coming from South Africa and watching so much of the work that Erwin Kotler did on behalf of Nelson Mandela. She has a special interest in this guest. Um, being part of his legal team. Uh, her TV journalism anchored, perhaps, her launch into politics, and now she's a distinguished member of the House here in Ontario. So help me welcome Indira Nadu Harris. I think I'm actually supposed to be up here first, so I'm going to come here first. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Sandra, and good evening, everyone. You know what? You know, when I look across this room, one of the things that strikes me the most is that this is an unbelievable room full of accomplished people who are leading thinkers in our country. And it is such a privilege to be here with you all today because I think that this suggests we are going to do some fantastic things in terms of our conversation today. Thank you for joining us here tonight for the launch of the Pearson Center's Pursuing Justice Project. And I'm honored, of course, to be your moderator this evening for this important and thought-provoking discussion. And I promise you, I promise you that this conversation won't disappoint. The Pearson Center's Pursuing Justice Project aims to promote fairness, inclusion, and social responsibility. But none of this can happen without thoughtful discussion. That's why we're here. We're here to explore ideas and through thoughtful, useful, deep dialogue. Justice is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as the quality of being fair and reasonable. But as we all know, justice can mean different things to different people. I've found that justice is actually most clearly defined for me when it is absent. For example, when a child is denied water or food because of the color of their skin, or when a man is locked away in solitary confinement for years because of his political views, or when entire families and communities are uprooted and relocated because of their ethnicity. These are all instances of injustice 
and yet these are all things that I have seen and experienced in my lifetime. Injustice exists, and justice can be fleeting. So our goal here tonight is to improve things, to make this a better world for all of us. We're a nation of immigrants, a country of individuals who come from all walks, walks of life and from all around the world. But while Canada celebrates our individualism, we have all agreed to set aside our personal needs and time for the time and for the greater good. To create, in the words of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, a just society. By focusing our attention on the pursuit of justice tonight, we can ask ourselves, do we live in a just society? How can we make Canada a better place? And what should we do when our values and our interests collide and produce an unjust society? So tonight's conversation will be a roadmap of sorts to pursuing justice. It will be about creating a Canadian society that is more peaceful and inclusive. And the man, the man who will guide us through this journey tonight is a man whose impressive career has been built on a solid foundation of justice and equality. After 16 years, Erwin Kotler left the political sphere last fall, and during those years, he was both the Minister of Justice and Attorney General, fighting tooth and nail, as I'm sure many of you remember, for justice and human rights here and abroad. And I actually had the honor of interviewing him a couple of times. Prior to entering politics, Erwin Kotler carved out a reputation as an expert in international law and human rights. He's been a lawyer, a professor, a writer, a politician, but always, always a champion of human rights. In fact, he's been called Freedom's Counsel, and he's here tonight, I think, to counsel us. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm welcome to the Honorable Erwin Cotton. Okay, so how do you feel? I'll, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm really very moved and have been moved, you know, from the inception of this uh, this evening. I, I just want to, if I may, just you know, thank the co-chairs, uh, Sandra and Monty. As I mentioned to Monty, coming out of back surgery and and being here this evening, uh, it really a, a, a tribute to the kind of uh, engagement that we've had from our two co-chairs, as Andrew uh, Cardozo has been from the beginning, the Pearson Center project. You know, when I heard each of the speakers. This evening, they each said something that had a, you know, a significance on it. When uh, Jim Carr spoke on the importance of uh, <coughs> being named the Lester Pearson, the Pearson Center, I recall that about two years ago, I was in a debate at the McDonald Laurier Center in Ottawa, and uh, I was asked to say who was the best uh, Prime Minister of Canada ever. I had to take a person, uh, and I said at the time, and I was lucky because I was told that I had to exclude contemporary people. I said, at the time, I said at the time that I regarded Lester Pearson as having been the best prime minister uh, this country ever had, both, <laughs> both because of his inspiring domestic agenda as well as his international uh, peace agenda, and Jim uh, referenced that. You know, when Catherine McKenna spoke this evening, I was reminded, as I've said before, and it's only a, an inspiring student, that, Catherine, that reminds you that you always learn best through your students, and that the students teach you and are an ongoing educational presence, and Catherine was, as was mentioned, the best of them. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> With, uh, with Carol and Bennett, it's an interesting story. I was elected in a by-election. I came to the first national caucus meeting, and then uh, Carolyn, whom I did not know at the time, was then chair of the women's caucus, and she invited us, the caucus to come to the weekly 
women's caucus. And so I went to the caucus and I opened the door and there were only women there and I said, I'm sorry, I think I've made a mistake. She said, no, 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 you know, everybody was welcome. You came next week, the next caucus meeting, Carolyn gets up again and says, uh, you're all invited to the, our weekly caucus meeting. I'm delighted to say we now have our first a male caucus member, and I ended up being, for a long time, the only uh, male caucus member. But I, I want to say something about that, because it was the best meeting I had every week. And the reason for that the re is because we discussed real issues that Canadians care about. The discourse in the women's caucus meeting was about health care, it was about child care, it was about the environment. It was regarded about Aboriginal people. It was regarded about all those issues of social justice and diversity and inclusion that underpin the Pearson Centre agenda. So I want to thank you, Karen, because I was the beneficiary all those years and continue to be of the uh, Women's Caucus agenda. And as you said, I would say women's rights are human rights, but I always would add, and there are no human rights without the rights of women. I want to say about uh, John Turner, he had the uh, temerity, I don't want to say the wisdom, to uh, give me my first job. I came straight out of law school and apparently I looked like somebody you would never hire. Uh, the, the reason I say that is because I, I was really straight out of the 60s and radical and all that. So, and I don't know if John remembers it, but we went on a state visit to the US administration. John Mitchell was the US Attorney General. And he took a look at me as I walked in with John. And I had the long hair and you know, the, guy, the whole thing, you know. And uh, he looked at John and he said to me, do you let people who look like that work for you? And, <laughs> and, and John said, you know, every minister needs one resident radical. Now, but, even that went a little too far because I had a picture in my office, my office was next door, and the picture was of Che Guevara, you see? <laughs> and every time, John may not remember it, every time he came into the office, he said, do you really have to have that picture of... <laughs> and I said, well, you know, of that revolutionary? And I said, well, the difference about Che Guevara, I said, he was a due process revolutionary. He said, what's that? I said, a revolutionary who advocates revolution, but without violence. And so uh, that was the kind of wonderful relationship we had. I, I said then, I say now, uh, John Turner was the best minister of justice and attorney general we had, and I had uh, really the privilege to be able to be his student and his pupil. So thank you, John. And uh, I'll, I'll just close with a word about Paul Martin. Uh, Carol, I think we'll remember this. Our first cabinet meeting, our first cabinet meeting, our first statement that he said to us, which always stayed with me, he said, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we will be guided by our treatment of the Aboriginal people. This is our legacy issue. And he added, there are no votes in this. It's not a political issue. But this is what justice is all about in this country. And I think that inspired us to make the issue of Aboriginal justice a priority on the agenda. And I just add and close on that point that Paul Martin, in my view, was the best prime minister that this country never really had the opportunity to fully experience. Oh, about Madeleine Mayer, I want to make a comment as well. Because while I had not, because she embodies the importance of understanding the principle of cooperative federalism as part of the pursuit of justice. And it's the ability to work together in common cause on the federal, provincial, territorial level with Aboriginal peoples. That's what moves and the pursuit of justice agenda forward, and that's what Madeline has been doing in her capacity. So thank you. 
So absolutely, absolutely that when it comes to justice in a country, how we treat our vulnerable is key. And I just want to say before we continue, you know, I had a picture of Che Guevara also in my university uh, dorm room. So we actually share more in common than I realized. There you go. I knew there was a kinship going <laughs> yeah. back to Guevara now. <laughs> anyway, for most of your professional life, Erwin, uh, in law and in government, you have pursued justice. You know, you've had an emphasis on human rights and social justice. And when people think of you, you know, they immediately think, think of someone who is consistently pursuing justice justice and human rights. So how did it all get started? What were the influences in your life that, you, that got you started in this path? Well, if one wants to know where I got started, I just want to recognize my wife who's here this evening and my daughter because uh, my, my, my wife, Ariella, my daughter, uh, Tanya, my other children uh, aren't able to be here because they're watching their children. Uh, but. Uh, they're part of this shared uh, pursuit of justice agenda, and justice has been a, a very important part of our, you know, uh, home uh, conversation. Uh, as I've said uh, elsewhere, uh, we were not always on the same side, but we we're all uh, in the pursuit of a common cause of justice. But I have to say that the, the initial lessons, the initial teachings, really uh, came from my both my parents of, of, of blessed memory. It was my father who taught me before I really understood the profundity of his words when he would say to me, exactly in these words, that the pursuit of justice is equal to all the other commandments combined. And he said, this is what you must teach onto your children. And this was a kind of ongoing teaching. But I have to say that it was my mother who, when she would hear my father saying this, would say to me that if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your community and beyond and understand and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. Otherwise, the pursuit of justice will remain a theoretical abstraction. And I suspect that as a result of these original teachings and others that followed, I got involved in the two great human rights struggles of the second half of the 20th century. The struggle for human rights in the former Soviet Union and the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. And got involved with the two people who embodied you know, the hope and, and the vision and the inspiration of those struggles. Anatoly Sharansky, as he then was a political prisoner in the former Soviet Union, and Nelson Mandela, as he was a political prisoner in uh, South Africa. And uh, in a way, being involved with political prisoners was fulfilling another teaching that I had when I was uh, young, and that is that the release of political prisoners, and in the Jewish tradition it's interesting about, the release of political prisoners is such an overriding commandment that you're allowed to even breach the Sabbath if you can bring about the liberation of political prisoners. So that stayed in my mind. So you devoted your life to the pursuit of justice and fairness. You spoke with and defended and helped out and supported some of the greatest advocates for freedom and uh, fairness in, in the world and in our history. As you mentioned, Mandela and Sakharov and uh, um, you know, uh, Jacobo Timmerman, uh, amongst others, right? I know a little bit about the South African struggle and the struggle against apartheid. And I have to tell you, from my perspective, it was really people like you, not just the people in the country who were fighting it, but those of you who were outside, who took the time to actually care about what was happening in that country and recognize that it was not the right thing and did everything you could to bring about change. So I want to say thank you for that. Um, you've been referred to as the Council for the Oppressed by Maclean's. So you have done a lot to ensure that we are furthering justice in our country and spoken with a lot of these people. But I want to ask you, as you went through these moments talking to Mandela or Sakharov, what did you learn? What did you learn from those experiences about human nature? And what can you pass on to us so that we can really learn from your experiences? I'll tell you, they, they had a profound commitment, each of them, you know, to the importance, interestingly enough, of uh, remembrance, uh, of 
the understanding of what a, a Czech novelist, Milan Kondura, once said, that the struggle of freedom against tyranny is the struggle of remembrance against forgetting. And Sharansky had a deep understanding of the human rights struggles in the Soviet Union in their historical and contemporary context. He's very much uh, sort of identified with the struggle for Soviet Jewry and the Jewish emigration movement. But what I found incredible about Sharansky is that he and Sakharov embodied the four major struggles for human rights in the Soviet Union at the time, which were not always that well known. Sharansky was a leader of the Helsinki movement, which gave birth to the Helsinki Final Act, one of the great human rights instruments of our time, which Canada had an important uh, role in, in its principles of freedom of emigration, reunification of families, and the right to know and act upon one's rights. He was very much involved in the democracy movement in the Soviet Union, for which he paid you know, the ultimate price of imprisonment for that uh, as well, and was the spokesperson uh, for Sakharov, who was the leader of the democracy movement. And Sakharov said of Sharansky and said to me, you know, Sharansky is each and every one of us. Sharansky represents us all. And that the Soviet Union imprisoned Sharansky because they wanted to imprison human rights, because they wanted to quarantine the voice uh, for human rights. Sharansky also went down the line for the ethnic and religious rights movements in the former Soviet Union for the uh, Ukrainian, for the Pentecostals, the Baptists. And I, I was amazed back here in Canada when uh, their counterparts here would invite me uh, to speak because they knew about what Sharansky was doing and inspiring them from the Soviet Union. And the final thing is Sharansky was the leader of the movement re other political prisoners in the former Soviet Union. So a heroic figure who embodied you know, the, these uh, human rights struggles as a person who put not just his livelihood, but in fact his life on the line and for which he was imprisoned. Nelson Mandela, same type of thing. A person who embodied, if you will, the great struggles of the 20th century, the struggle for freedom, the struggle for equality, the struggle for democracy, uh, the struggle uh, for peace. A person who endured 27 years in a South African prison and came out to not only preside over the dismantling of apartheid, but to become the president of the first ever democratic, free, egalitarian South Africa. And I think what both those political prisoners teach us is the importance of freeing political prisoners. Because I shudder to think what might have happened had they somehow not been uh, freed. Sharansky transformed the face of the former Soviet Union Mandela transformed the face of South Africa. Both of them transformed the cause of freedom and democracy in the world. And dear, if I may take a moment, I think I told you, a, a remarkable connection that took place between the two cases. I came to uh, South Africa in 1981 as a guest of the anti-apartheid movement. I was then uh, working on behalf of uh, Sharansky, who was then uh, in prison, and some young students uh, law students in the University of Wadrasran asked me if I would speak, you know, uh, to the uh, law students. And I said, sure. And they said, well, what would you like to speak about? And I said, well, what I would like to speak about, I'm not sure uh, if I should do it. I said, what I'd love to speak about is, if Sharansky, why not Mandela? I said, but Mandela is a banned person here in South Africa. I don't want to get any of you in trouble. I said, nothing will happen to me. I'm a Canadian, but you're living here inside. And they said, no, no, that's it. That's what we want. Speak on that. And so I spoke in 1981. It was one of the largest crowds I was told that, that ever uh, gathered and a lot of, uh, you know, black people and people of, of, of color. And at the end of my talk, I uh, was arrested. My wife who was with me. <laughs> I was getting used to this because I had been arrested and expelled in the former Soviet Union. That was three months after we were married. And then uh, now I, she's outside waiting for me to finish my speech and I disappear again. And a remarkable thing occurred. While I was being detained, uh, the, one of the officers there said, uh, Mr. Kotler, do you know uh, our foreign minister, Pig Botha? I said, no. Uh, he said, well, he's asked us to bring you to see him. And I was brought to Pig Bota, foreign minister. I come into his 
office, and I said, he says, you're probably wondering why I asked to see you. And I said, frankly, yes. He said, who is that on the wall? And he pointed to a big picture, and this is on the wall of Pig Bota, the southern front, a picture of Sharansky. And he says, that's the reason I wanted to see you. I couldn't understand how somebody like yourself, who defends a great hero like Sharansky, an anti, uh, against the communist uh, Soviet Union, against the evil Soviet Union, can speak in the same breath about Mandela, who's also a communist and who's also an enemy. And I said, well, I have to tell you, uh, Mr. Botha, both Sharansky and Mandela are fighting for the same thing. They're both fighting for freedom. They're both fighting for, they're both fighting for human rights. And I went on in that vein. And then he went on to lecture me about apartheid, that I didn't understand it, that it was really, I'll never forget this, that it was an exercise in democratic pluralism, as he told me. <laughs> uh, uh, separate, this was a, 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 another sort of refinement of separate but equal. And then the conversation ended, went on for about three hours. The conversation ended with me saying, uh, I have to tell you, Mr. Bota, I agree with you about uh, the Soviet Union as a major uh, human rights violator. But South Africa is the only post-World War II country that has institutionalized racism as a matter of law. I said apartheid is not just a racist philosophy, it's a racist legal regime. And for so long as it is necessary, from wherever I am, I'm going to fight this racist legal regime until this apartheid is dismantled. And then he uh, looked at me. He says, you're a, very, you're a very brash young man. And maybe I should have let them keep you in prison or have you expelled. But then he turned to Sharansky. But because of Sharansky and your work, I'm going to let you go about uh, South Africa, see who you want, you know, talk to whoever you want. You come back. 10 days from now and tell me what you think. So I do that, come back 10 days later, and he says to me, so young man, what do you think? I said, uh, you're right, uh, South Africa is an exercise in democratic pluralism. He said, see, I told you. I said, if you're white, I said, if you're colored or you're black, it's even worse than I thought it was. Well, I want to just close with something that took place several years ago. I looked up Pig Bota. Uh, I hadn't seen in a long time, and it was a fascinating conversation. Time does not permit, but just in very quick one-liners. Uh, Big Bota said to me, you know, I want to tell you, he says, I never forgot uh, that uh, conversation. He says, you were, and he repeated the words, a very brash young man. He said, but I've followed you since then. He said, I know everything you've done, but you don't know what happened with me, he said, after that. He said, I want to tell you, he said, I became the first minister in the South African government to call for the release of Nelson Mandela. I then, I left the apartheid government and I became a member of Mandela's African National Congress. And I want to tell you that I have been an opponent of apartheid ever since. The motto of that is everybody can, at the end of the day, can be taught to pursue justice. That's a very important lesson for us to hear and, and a very important uh, observation for you to share with us. Thank you. Um, you were appointed Minister of Justice. I mean, you had many roles. You were a teacher, a professor, a community leader. Uh, you know, you did all kinds of things when it came to public service, but you were appointed Minister of Justice. And you told me earlier that you felt you sort of fell into politics by accident. So I have to ask you, how did you feel when you found out that you were being named Minister of Justice? And what tools did you use to help you make uh, some of the decisions you had to make? Well, you know, I, I was very surprised. I still remember I got a call from Paul Martin, and the prime minister, and uh, he's, his first words, actually the only words in the conversation, to tell you the truth, the first words, what do you do with somebody who has radical ideas about human rights? And then I said, uh, well, Prime Minister, I always thought that uh, human rights is in the pursuit of justice. And he said to me, thank you, Irwin. You're, I just want to tell you, you're now the Minister of Justice and Attorney General of Canada. <laughs> and that was it. He says, somebody will be calling you to tell you about the logistics, read the swearing in, etc. Now, after we were sworn in, 
You know, we had the gotcha journalism press conference, and, and Catherine and, and Jim and others would have been uh, experiencing uh, this uh, recently, Carolyn, over the years. And before they would put any questions to me, I said the following. I said, I will be guided in my work by one overarching principle. And it was as if my parents were talking through me at that time. I said, the pursuit of justice. And within that, the promotion and protection of equality, of equality not just as another however important section of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, but equality as an organizing principle for the building of a just society. And the promotion and protection of human dignity for the building of a society which is not only just, but one that is compassionate and humane. After I was sworn in, an incredible thing happened, and I'll close this quote with it because it, it influenced the rest of uh, my work and I believe it will underpin uh, the Pearson uh, Center. I got a call to say there were a group of Aboriginal law students from a Kitsurak Law School in Nunavut who were there and had asked uh, to meet with me. And what I mean, I said, sure, with pleasure. And I never forgot that encounter and it influenced me throughout my work uh, as Minister of Justice. <clears throat> and they said to me, Professor Collar, we're not just law students. We're Aboriginal law students. We come with a past, with a history, with a heritage, with our own spirituality, with our own languages, with our own indigenous legal system. And we've been dispossessed from all that. We've been dislocated from our land, from our past, from our history, from our heritage, from our spirituality, from our languages, from our own indigenous legal system. It's not that we go to court because we want to nurture a grievance. We go to court to reconnect to who we are. We go to court to anchor ourselves in our identity. We go to court to give expression to our indigenous legal system. But in whatever we do, we feel a great deal of pain because we believe that the Canadian government and the Canadian people don't understand who we are, where we've come from, and what we aspire to be. And I said to them at, at that moment, I said, all I can say to you is that as a government, and I know this is our Prime Minister's uh, commitment, that we will try to understand and feel that history, that experience, that pain, and your aspirations. I said, you know, I'm reminded of a story, I said, comes from my tradition, but other traditions where a student comes uh, to his or her rabbi, and she says, Rabbi, we love you. And the rabbi says, do you know what hurts me? And the student says, Rabbi, why do you ask if we know what hurts you if we tell you we love you? And the rabbi says, because if you don't know what hurts me, you can't tell me you love me. I said, that's a profound principle, a profound principle of human relationships. I said, but it is a principle by which we will try to relate to you, to the Aboriginal people. And then I said something else. I said, at the risk of being uh, presumptuous and maybe even pretentious, I said, uh, I also come from an Aboriginal people. I said, a, a people that still inhabits the same land, embraces the same uh, religion, hearkens to the same Aboriginal uh, prophets of Isaiah and, and the like, studies the same Aboriginal Bible, speaks the same Aboriginal language, Hebrew, and bears the same Aboriginal name, Israel, as we did 3,500 years ago. Whereupon they then approached me and said, you know, we thought this was going to be another blah, blah lecture by another white man. Welcome one Aboriginal people to another. <laughs> and and I, I told that story afterwards in different encounters because it's important People have to speak out of the authenticity of their identity. And the best thing that distinguishes Canada almost internationally, and that is so inspiring about Canada, is that we can each be anchored in the particularities of our identities at the same time that we give expression to the universal values that must inspire us all. And that experience with the Aboriginal people then led me to and with this I conclude to articulate what I call the seven R's of Aboriginal justice, 
which would be a priority on our justice agenda. The first was recognition of the first R, the recognition of Aboriginal peoples as the original inhabitants of Canada. I'm glad we paid appropriate tribute this evening uh, to where we are sitting. Second, respect for the Aboriginal people's distinguishable constitutional system as set forth in section 25 and 35 of our constitutional act. The third R was redress, redress for past injustices, including in particular the uh, residential system and what Carolyn is now uh, engaging in, the plight of missing and murdered Aboriginal women, which brings me to the fourth R. And the fourth R goes in two ways. The over-representation of Aboriginal people, in particular Aboriginal uh, women, in the criminal justice system as inmates and victims uh, in that system, and the under-representation of Aboriginal people in our justice system as uh, judges, as law enforcement officers, and the like. The fifth R was responsiveness, that a government has to be responsive to the uh, Aboriginal people, as I tried to share with them, but learn uh, uh, from them. The sixth thing is if we do the first five R's of uh, recognition and respect and redress and representation and responsiveness, this will lead to the sixth R, which is reconciliation, and all that will bring about the seventh R, which is a renewal of our people-to-people, nation-to-nation relationship with the Aboriginal peoples. So you talked about our future being anchored in our past. So I have to ask you, when you look at Canada and where we are today, we talked about a just society. In your opinion, what have been probably some of the greatest influences, things that have had the greatest impact on justice in this country? And what do you think are some of the key issues facing us when we look towards the future? I think one of the most important things that happened uh, to justice in this country and to the Canadian uh, people was the adoption of the Constitution Act and its centerpiece, uh, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. That had a transformative impact, <laughs> not transformative impact, not only on our laws, but on our lives. Not only on how we litigate, but how, in fact, uh, we can live. I don't think it's always appreciated, the revolutionary character of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I remember uh, our former Chief Justice Antonio Lamer saying on the 10th anniversary of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, he referred to it as a revolutionary development comparable to the discoveries of Pasteur in science. Now, some people thought that this was somewhat overly enthusiastic rhetoric, but we have to appreciate that the, the transformative and indeed revolutionary impact that the Charter and the Constitution Act had. We moved from being a parliamentary democracy to being a constitutional democracy. We moved from the sovereignty of parliament to the sovereignty of the Constitution. Judges moved from being arbiters of legal federalism, which they still, still are, to being the guarantors of human rights, not because judges sought that power, let alone usurped that power, but because Parliament vested that power in them in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And most important, individuals and groups in this country, and, and particularly minorities and others, who had been almost passive uh, respondents in a constitutional process organized around a legal federalism, a division of powers between governments, learned about the limitation of power on the exercise of power, regardless of government, and that they could be not just passive recipients, but rights holders, rights claimants. And the reason we have a Civil Marriage Act in this country is because we had a situation post-charter where that issue was justiciable, where gays and lesbians could make claims before the courts, and we could thereby transform justice uh, in this country. So I would start with a chart and very quickly just enumerate others. The importance of 
parliament in the process. You know, we sometimes uh, marginalize parliament. John Turner taught me the importance of what a parliamentarian is all about. And it reminded me of a first lesson my father taught me when I was brought to parliament, 11 years old. And he looked up with me at the parliament building. He said, son, and in that day, you know, he spoke sometimes to me in Latin. He said, son, uh, he was a lawyer, but Latin was something he took in the universe. He said, son, this is vox populi. This is the voice of the people. And I remember thinking, you know, my last years in parliament, you know, if I would say that now, people would say, what? You know, I mean, uh, regrettably, the undue partisanship and incivility and polarization underpinned that important message that my father taught me, that John Turner practiced, and that was, we are first and foremost parliamentarians. We're here as trustees of the public good. I got elected not to represent the liberals in my riding, I got elected to represent all the people in my riding. <laughs> and, and so we have to respect, and uh, Catherine was speaking, the importance of collaborative, cooperative work across party lines. Environment, as she put it, climate change is not a partisan issue. It's an issue that speaks to the public good. And finally, the importance of the integrity and independence of the judiciary. And I remember if I had been asked when I was first appointed a Minister of Justice and Attorney General what were my priorities, I would not have said appointment of judges amongst them. But I learned, you know, at the end of my tenure that this is one of the most important things a justice minister does because at the end of the day, that is a legacy issue. This is what remains long after those of us who had the temporary stewardship of, of being minister. This is what lives on. And so I took seriously not only what judges could be appointed or who could be appointed on the merit-based approach, but the, impo the importance of having a judicial appointments process that was comprehensive and inclusive and representative and accountable, and that reflected the pluralism and diversity of this great country. We're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you this. You've heard Prime Minister Justin Trudeau talk about the fact that Canada is back when he talks about the world stage. You've had many experiences when it comes to justice, both in this country and outside of this country. So I have to ask you, you've referred to the current times as there being a growing global disorder. What role do you think Canada should and can play when it comes to uh, our world and the, gl the global, uh, global society? Well, I, I think that the, we have to make the pursuit of justice, the pursuit of, of human rights, as an organizing idiom of our governmental uh, policy, of our parliament, of civil uh, society. It has to be not just a, a priority on our agenda, but it has to be there as a matter of principle and policy implementation. Let me just give you two examples. We are uh, on the eve of the 22nd anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, where from April 7th to the end of June 1994, one million Rwandans, mostly uh, Tutsis, were murdered. And the horror about that Rwandan genocide was not only the horror of the genocide itself, but what made it so unspeakable was that that genocide was preventable. Nobody could say we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as with Darfur, nobody could say we knew, we knew but we did not act. Or recently, and it's the fifth anniversary now of the Syrian that peaceful protest which began five years ago in Dara, Syria, by a group of young people who were disappeared after that protest. Those who came to replace them were then tortured and murdered. And then the scorched earth policy of Assad's Syria began with the barrel bombs, with the murder, with the torture, with the disappearances and the like. 
And it's now been, the, it's, we're here meeting here, that's why I remember the fifth anniversary of, the, of that peaceful process, but of that massive killing field, of those massive atrocities. And I was some of those who wrote one year after it began, in 2012. I wrote an op-ed at the time when, quote unquote, there were only 7,000 that had been killed. Now we're talking about a half a million that have been murdered, about 12.5 million people that have been displaced, about 5 million refugees, the greatest humanitarian catastrophe that we are now witnessing since the end of the Second World War, but we are focusing necessarily on the consequences of what happened in terms of relief and rescue of the refugees, but we cannot ignore the causes of what led to it that are still there and the, whose epicenter was Syria. And I wrote a piece at the, at the time in which I sought to invoke the responsibility to prevent. Uh, we just had its to protect, prevent the, the 10th anniversary of that important doctrine, which says that if you ever have a country and a government in which war crimes and crimes against humanity, let on God forbid, genocide, is being committed, and that government, as in Assad, Syria, is not only unwilling or unable to do something about it, but is actually the author of that criminality, then there's a responsibility on behalf of the internet national community to intervene, to intervene and protect <laughs> the innocent civilian. Those of us who wrote about it at the time were told, well, you know, if you intervene, this will lead to sectarian warfare in Syria, this will lead to civil war, this uh, will lead to jihadists coming in. I hate to say that everything we were told would happen if we intervened happened because we didn't intervene. There is one of the lessons I was taught, and one of the lessons in, in history is the dangers of indifference and inaction in the face of mass atrocity. And now that early parental and educational lesson that I, that I was taught, you know, thou shalt not stand idly by while thy brothers and sisters' blood is being shed. Well, that's the forerunner of what the responsibility to prevent and protect is all about. And that's why I, when I was once asked when I became a member of parliament, if you had to sum up in one line why you ended up being a member of parliament, I said, I can sum it up in one word. I said, Rwanda. I said, I said to myself that if God forbid something like that should ever happen again, I don't want to be on the outside looking in. I want to be in the inside in which we could try and do something about it. And you shared with me, and there just before we walked up here, how you moved from being a, a, a media and a critic to being you know, a member of parliament, because that is a place where working together in common cause, we can advance the pursuit of justice. And that's why I'm so delightful that this is the project that will underpin the Pearson Center. So I've been told I have a little more time, which is amazing. Uh, you're talking about the Middle East, and we've seen a number of things happen. We've seen, for example, um, a rise worldwide in violent anti-Semitism. We've seen an increase in destructive Islamophobia. And uh, we're seeing a lot of conflicts arise out of that, as you talked about a bit. What role do you think Canada should play in pursuing justice? You said already that we can't stand idly by any of us as individuals when we see injustice occur. So what role do you think Canada can play to help advance peace in this region? I, maybe I can share with you one stillborn idea or, or project that I, I have always regretted never was implemented. And Carol may remember, in the Martin government, uh, I became the first minister in the government to visit the Middle East. And I had an idea at that time in terms of the Middle East, you know, for what I, I called a, the ME4, a Middle East Justice Project, which would bring together the ministers of justice of Egypt and Jordan and Israel and the Palestinian Authority, bring them together in a justice summit that would be hosted by Canada, which I hoped and felt would have a peace dividend. And so I went 
to the Middle East twice, met with each of the ministers of, of justice of the four. And the reason we chose those four was because Egypt and Jordan had peace treaties uh, with Israel. Palestinians were involved in a peace process with Israel. And as I said, we felt that the coming together of the ministers of justice could maybe have a peace dividend. I want to say that the four ministers of justice not only agreed to have Canada host that justice summit, they agreed on the principles, the justice principles that would be the agenda for that uh, summit. And regrettably, um, we lost the election and that idea never uh, was allowed to uh, be tested to be implemented. I still think a justice summit makes a great deal of sense, though it's more difficult to do it now. I do think that we can return to the foundational principles that were to underpin that Justice Summit, which I have to tell you the Justice Ministers accepted at the time. And we had principles, again, I have to brutally do it in one-liners for reasons of time, and even for this, you might say I'm taking too much time, but the principles were number one, and because it was a Canadian policy at the time, that the cornerstone of Canada's policy in the Middle East, you know, begins with and remains respect for the legitimacy and security and well-being of uh, the state of Israel. The second principle was that the Palestinians are a people, they have a right to self-determination, and that right is to find expression in an independent, democratic Palestinian state. Those words were not accidental. It wasn't just to you know, pay lip service to an independent Palestinian state. It was to establish a democratic, rule of law, rights protecting Palestinian state. Because if we care about the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people, the last thing we need to do is impose another, you know, authoritarian state in the Middle East. So we need a democratic, rights protecting Palestinian state in the Middle East, which led to the third principle that I support, two states for two peoples. Not just a two state solution. It's, two states for two peoples. And what we could begin with is projects that bring the two peoples together now, while it may be difficult in terms of the states. The fourth was UN Security Council Resolution 242, which prescribed foundational principles for the right of all peoples uh, and states in the in Middle East to uh, security and freedom free from threats and acts of force and direct negotiations between the parties for that purpose. And that was the whole uh, Israeli-Palestinian thing that we had envisioned out of our last two principles were or the dangers of uh, terrorism, therefore the condemnation of terrorism from whatever quarter or for whatever purpose, the dangers of incitement, that what we needed was a culture of education for peace and not education for incitement, and finally that the government could play a role with respect to promoting and pursuing and protecting principles of constitutional governance, democracy, freedom, human rights, and the rule of law in the Middle East. I think we can go back to that blueprint, and that for me would be something that would not only be a kind of vision for peace, but at the end of the day for friendly and protective and freedom for the peoples of the Middle East within their states and between states and between peoples. So, you may be retired from politics, but from what I understand, you're not necessarily taking up golf. You're not uh, spending your time at the cottage fishing. Instead, what you're doing is you've just launched a new Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. And from what I hear, it just sounds like an amazing project. Can you tell me what made you decide to do this at this point in your life? And uh, really, how does it fit in with your life's work, which is pursuing justice? You know, well, you mentioned and there a golf and fishing. First of all, I, got, I was a caddy and got hit in the head twice with a golf ball, so that ended my golfing career. And I never learned how to uh, fish, though I love fish. But the, the, <laughs> the main thing was that Raoul Wallenberg is our first honorary citizen. And he embodied the fact how one person with the compassion to care and the courage to act can confront evil, can resist, 
and thereby transform history. It's not maybe as well known as it deserves to be that in 1944, some 440,000 Jews had been deported to the de Hungarian Jews to the death camps in Auschwitz in 10 weeks. Raoul Wallenberg arrived in Hungary after that had happened in the first six months of 1944. He then managed to save the remnant of 100,000 Jews in the six months that he was there. I mean, an incredible, heroic uh, impact and the impact of what one person do. So I thought that given that he was our first honorary citizen, uh, this would be a kind of inspiring er effort to set up. I was going to do this when I was a law professor, then accidentally became a parliamentarian. And I didn't go into this reason why. I didn't want to take up time. But the thing is that I felt what we needed uh, to do at this point was to establish an international consortium of parliamentarians, scholars, jurists, human rights defenders, NGOs, and students united in the pursuit of justice, inspired by and anchored in Raoul Wallenberg's uh, humanitarian legacy. And that's why there are four thematic projects. I'm not going to go uh, into them, uh, but they reflect some of the values I mentioned this evening about promoting and, and pursuing uh, e equality, about uh, the responsibility uh, to uh, protect, about combating uh, racism and hatred, and, and the importance of defending and freeing uh, political prisoners. Because I think each time we free a political prisoner, we can transform a universe. And right now, some of the political prisoners I've been involved in are going to be part of the centers, Raoul Wallenberg Center's work. I hope Pearson Center may take up uh, one or more of these cases. And they include, and you'll pardon me, from a bit, these are people who really need our help. The imprisoned Saudi blogger Raif uh, Badawi, <laughs> whose wife and children are refugees in, in Quebec and was imprisoned for no other thing, no other reason but because he gave expression to that fundamental freedom of freedom of speech. And for that, uh, he was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, a thousand lashes, and the like. A second political prisoner is Leopoldo Lopez, the leader of the Democratic opposition in Venezuela. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. The new Democratic Parliament in Venezuela just voted yesterday to amnesty the political prisoners of Leopoldo Lopez, but the president of Venezuela said that will never be done. We have to move to free Leopoldo Lopez and the other political prisoners in Venezuela. The third, and I just today got an email, uh, is this great heroic figure in Iran, the Ayatollah Burjedi uh, in, in Iran. Uh, he is a Shiite cleric in Iran who, while in Iran, stood up for freedom of religion in Iran, stood up for the persecuted Baha'i uh, in Iran, condemned anti-Semitism while in uh, Iran, he became known and is known as the Mandela of Iran. And he has now endured 11 years of imprisonment where he's been denied critical and urgent medical care. Another person on whose behalf we need uh, to stand up for. And the final one, you know, there is the slogan, Black Lives Matter, but there is a, a imprisoned black person in Mauritania who's the leader of the anti-slavery movement in Mauritania, Biram Abu Abiyad, and he has been imprisoned in Mauritania for advocating freedom for those enslaved in Mauritania. And ironically enough, while Mauritania moved to adopt an anti-slavery law, their first act after adopting that law was to imprison the leader of the anti-slavery movement in uh, Mauritania. So he's a, another person. I just mentioned these four political prisoners. Pearson Center might think about taking up one or more of those cases. We should all consider about how we can help those cases and causes because at the end of the day, as I say, we free a political uh, prisoner. We put an end to not only their own individual torment, but the torment of their families, the torment of their loved ones uh, who endure. By the way, uh, just a side point, every political prisoner that I was involved in who was freed had a spouse that was working nonstop on their behalf, 
while they were in prison. And we should never forget that. So let's all become uh, the spouses of the political prisoners and bring about their liberation and bring about a better world. Erwin Kotler, amazing stories, amazing lessons, amazing life. Thank you so much for sharing this with us today. Very much appreciated. I wish I would have had a pen and a piece of paper because I wish I would have been able to take down some of the notes. A lot of lessons learned here. Pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a few quick, uh, a few quick points. I, uh, John Baird has been here, and I just want to tell him. John Baird came back from Burma. I, mean, I had the opportunity of having a conversation with him, and he said when he met Aung San Suu Kyi, he felt he was in the presence of greatness. Irwin, this evening we feel we have been in the presence of greatness. Uh, thank you for your life's dedication, your continuing work in this area. Thank you. I do want to mention a couple of MPs who came in later on. Ali Asasi is here, and Anthony Housefather, a special mention for Anthony. He is the uh, Member of Parliament for Mount Royal, the successor to Irwin Kotler. Please stand. Um, if, if you want more information on this, on this project, the Pursuing Justice Project, please look at the inside uh, cover of your, of your booklet. We have a, a roundtable planned with Justice Sinclair. In, in terms of uh, the economy uh, for tomorrow project, we have, uh, which is another one of our events coming up on the back cover, uh, we have a, a speech scheduled by John McCallum on May the 24th here in Toronto. Um, I do encourage you to look at page five for more information on the Raoul Wallenberg Center. Uh, their contact information is there, and I do encourage you to get involved in the, in the great work that Irwin will be doing with them. I want to thank our sponsors listed on page 20 and uh, 21. And uh, thank you to a couple of people. I want to thank Sandra Pupatello for chairing our, uh, with Monty Quinter, for chairing our committee and for moderating today. And to Gary Gladstone, who's been, who's been instrumental in a lot of what happened today. I want to introduce, I want to introduce you, to you briefly uh, to Mika Buckley Pearson. Um, she is the great-granddaughter of Lester B. Pearson, is in, involved in our events. She's the great-granddaughter. We think she's great, so sometimes we, talk, we call her the great-great-granddaughter of Lester B. Pearson. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to introduce you. Stay here. Thank you, Andrew. I'm, I'm one of several grandchildren, but I often have the honor of speaking very briefly at Pearson Center events, and it really is a privilege for me to be able to speak on behalf of the entire family. And uh, the family, of course, extends its gratitude to everyone for coming out to this event and, and for taking part of this incredible project. Um, but first, I just wanted to say I know I stand between you and the bar and bed, <laughs> so I really won't take too long. But I wanted to explicitly, because I think I'm one of the last speakers before um, Andrew closes out, to thank the center quite unequivocally, particularly Andrew and Sandra and Monty, but also the staff and volunteers that make events like this run so well and so that everyone can enjoy it as much as they did. So if you'd please join me in a round of applause. Absolutely. And in particular, I'd like to thank the Centre for taking on such an important project, I think. It's quite clear that the, the Honourable Erwin Collar really demonstrates that the pursuit of justice never ceases. Although it's of course the, the goal and the ideal, we will always have to continue working towards it. And we will need to keep fanning the flames of this endeavor for many more years to come. Because even though Canada leads in many ways in justice both at home and globally, there is so much more work to be done. And it's really critical to have a project such as this, as well as all of you that are clearly committed to, to its success um, going forward. And in particular, I wanted to note that it's really an incredible honor for me not only to be able to thank you on behalf of the family, but also to be in the presence of so many wonderful people in the room and, and remarkable people. And of course, many of them have been listed and I don't want to repeat too much, but I, I do want to highlight 
those that shared in and contributed immensely to my great-grandfather's vision. Uh, in particular, of course, the former Prime Minister John Turner, as well as Adrian MacDonald and Sharon Sol Solzberg Gray, who in their own right contributed, as well as their husbands were part of my great-grandfather's cabinet. So thank you all very much for being here and for your continued commitment to achieving that vision. And finally, I wanted to make a note, uh, unfortunately, Catherine McKenna had to leave, but I wanted to point her out in particular because she was actually my professor last year at the Monk School of Global Affairs, and I was one of the last students that had the opportunity to learn from her before she, she ran off to campaign and to win a very hard-fought election. But it's through those studies and my time with her, as well as my time with my family and through other endeavors that... I've really come to, to recognize that even though you know, more than 50 years separate my great-grandfather's um, parliament and government and, and all of his efforts and, and the world that I live in today and that, and that all of us continue to live in and to fight for justice in, I think there are many elements of his vision that continue to be true. And in particular, that, that we want a Canada that is open and a Canada that is tolerant and a Canada that celebrates its diversity and that fights for equality. And not only to have that at home, but also to have that on the global stage. And so finally, again, I'd just like to thank all of you for, for being part of that vision and for continuing to articulate that. Thank you. My name is Karen Mock, and it falls on me uh, to thank our wonderful guest speaker, or, or chief guest, I guess we called, uh, a little more formally. I was absolutely thrilled, Erwin, when you said that you would do this, um, and I'm honored to call you a mentor and friend. We also promised Erwin, as modest as he is, that we would not call it a tribute. So that's why you can't find the word tribute anywhere, you know, in, in the program. The tribute committee had to have some kind of a different name. But Irwin, it really is a tribute to you that all these people are here because you're an inspiration to us all, a role model indeed. I also need to tell you before we do the final thank you, that we didn't have a Q&A because you're all invited to the dessert reception to continue the conversation and the photo ops that we missed earlier. And if we could have your indulgence to please let Mr. Kotler escape to the reception so that you can all join him there and the media wants to join him as well and we can all party together. <laughs> So Erwin, please come and join us here just for this uh, small token of our appreciation. Tzedek, Tzedek, Terdof. Justice, justice, you shall pursue. Why is it said twice in Deuteronomy? Justice, justice, shalt thou pursue. Because we are told to run after justice, with justice. As Irwin has taught us, righteousness must be pursued with righteousness because achieving justice any other way is not just. So in the card it says, on behalf of the Pearson Center for Progressive Policy, please accept this token of our gratitude and respect. We hope you will find it as appropriate as we did, to wish you well in this next stage in your lifelong pursuit of justice. <coughs> With sincere appreciation and warmest regards, the Pursuing Justice Planning Committee. And you're allowed to open it. <laughs> because everybody, when you get a plaque or a painting, everybody knows what it is, right? You're allowed to open it, and I'll give you a hint. It's kosher. Wow. <laughs> wow, this is a, a wonderful uh, mezuzah to put up on uh, outside our home, in our home and 
outside the entries in our home. Uh, most importantly, it has a constant reminder, and it says it in Hebrew, tzedek, tzedek, tirdof, justice, justice shall you pursue. And I want to thank you, uh, Karen, for rounding out the message that I forgot to mention, and that is you must pursue justice justly. And it is you who brought up, and that's why I say we learn from our students, and you have been, not me, a mentor to you, you have been a mentor in your anti-racism uh, work uh, to all of us. So I want to thank you, and that is really what the pursuit of justice is all about, the manner in which it is embodied with the struggle of justice for all and equality and dignity for each. Thank you. You're still the best, man. Thanks, man. Great to see you.